Um, so the goal of the presentation uh, is really to try to give a, a good overview of solar and how it's being implemented and the different parts and pieces, how it works, you know, all the different aspects of it as much as we can uh, this morning and um, hopefully it'll help in your inspection process and understanding what you're looking at when you're out in the field or, uh, or when uh, plans and drawings come in for a review. Um, hopefully it just gives a better understanding of the whole process and the whole thing. Uh, so, a little bit of background about, um, about my background with solar. Uh, first of all, uh, live the talk. Um, I built my house uh, 18 years ago. It was completely off-grid, meaning not connected to any utilities whatsoever. So it's a net zero house, actually before the term net zero was even really invented. So I've uh, really been doing this for a long time. That doesn't mean I know everything, but it does mean that I've tried a lot of things that don't work and have a pretty good idea of, you know, different products out there, how they work, how they interact with each other, and uh, the way I'm set up, it is battery storage with a generator backup um, and no lack of amenities. In other words, you know, I've got wind power and solar. Um, and no lack of amenities, you can power your jacuzzis, you can power your, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, solar will do all of that, just a matter of size and uh, power requirements. You do learn to be very, very efficient with your power and use it when the sun is out. It's your best time, obviously. Um, so again, started that uh, number of years ago. Um, 25 years ago when I got into the solar business, there wasn't much of a solar business. Really, it uh, started off with mostly doing cattle water pumping stations out on uh, ranches, uh, mostly in California. Um, and that was pretty much the scope of the work for, for a long time. Uh, then it started getting into a few off-grid homes where people, and you know, you know, a lot of these homes were not permitted type homes. These are a lot of off-grid, backwoods kinds of places. Uh, then. Uh, some utilities and states changed the laws where you could actually interconnect your solar systems with the utility. And that's when the solar business, particularly out west, started to really take off. Uh, and uh, primarily out west because the cost of power out in California is so expensive compared to most of the rest of the country, uh, typically paying uh, more than double what you have here. Um, and then uh, from there, a lot of commercial PV started building up after, uh, after this started. The grid-connected homes really kicked off also, not only because of the cost of power and the allowance uh, by the utilities and by the uh, uh, utility commission, um, really largely because of incentives that got put in place, really making it uh, parable in terms of cost. And that made a huge difference as soon as obviously it became economical to put in solar, people started putting in solar in a big way. Prior to that, it was a lot of people who felt, well, it's the green thing to do and I want to be, you know, environmental and all this kind of thing, which is all good and well, but it, you're not going to build an industry on it. It's got to be economically viable before it really grows. Uh, so my personal involvement in all this, I, I had my own solar company for a number of years, still, still do, but uh, uh, started off doing, as I say, the water pumping, the off-grid homes, then grid-connected homes, and into commercial PV. And uh, I, I moved a lot out of the grid-connected type homes uh, just because a lot of big companies like Solar City and others uh, came into the market, and they do a great job, and they could do it much you know, with the volume, they could do it at a much lower cost than I could. And I quickly saw, you know, when you're the only one in the market, your margins are very good. And quickly with companies like Solar City, the, the market got much tighter, and pretty soon you're working quite a bit harder for less and less. And so uh, moved into commercial PV, where still that market has uh, been, been excellent. So today, we're going to talk, uh, we've gone, whoops gone through the introduction. Um, we're going to get into how solar PV works, uh, solar PV warranties, and the system's life expectancy. 
uh, rebates and incentives, solar implementation, the process and steps involved with actually getting it done, going through your uh, permitting departments, going through the actual installation, uh, utility interconnection requirements, and then uh, we'll talk about the solar PV, I call it code corner, and that's where we'll uh, get into uh, you know, specific code required uh, items for that. And for that, we have uh, Roosevelt Fortson and Robert Hughes with us. Uh, Robert, put your hand up. And is Roosevelt here? I don't see him. Not yet. OK. Well, that's later. Um, and then we'll have an open discussion and questions at the end for anything that we didn't cover or any additional questions that you might have. So the future is based on decisions made today. Um, you know, the slide is always a little bit questionable in terms of, you know, we've got burning off gas and, and the sunshine. Of course, solar is a relatively clean industry once you've made all the products and everything. Um, and uh, what's a little deceiving is, of course, gas, natural gas is also actually a pretty clean industry in terms of energy production. but. Uh, Nonetheless, solar is part of our energy mix and will become more and more part of our energy mix in this country, and, and it's an important step. Um, solar is not the solution to our energy needs. You know, I've been in it for a long time. It's a great energy source, but it's not the end all. It's not the answer to that we've all been waiting for in terms of a perfect, clean, renewable energy. And that's largely because it's a variable load. Uh, it, we have a lot of solar power when the sun is out, not much at night. And therefore, uh, it's not a good base load. You need gas plants, you need other sources, whether it's nuclear, wh whatever, uh, to balance out that load, something that can provide power on a, an immediate as needed basis. Solar would work as a great, uh, quote unquote, base load if we had an uh, energy storage system that was worked out, that, that worked, batteries are not that efficient of an energy storage system, very expensive and very not clean. Um, you know, we've uh, all heard about Tesla and uh, they're putting together a, a big battery plant and it's supposed to change the whole industry in terms of batteries, but it's still extremely expensive and it will be for quite some time and it still uses a lot of uh, chemicals and materials that are less than ideal for our environment and uh, even at the most efficient it's uh, you know it's a battery it's not that efficient in converting energy um, other storage solutions are in process uh, there's a lot of uh, new flywheel technology coming into play um, other things as well but really uh, solar is part of the energy mix it's not not everything Wind is much the same way as solar in that uh, it's a variable source. When it's windy, you've got great power, and the rest of the time you don't, and it fluctuates all over the place. And so it's difficult to have too much solar or wind on any grid just because uh, you're trying to always balance the load with the production. Um, so again, solar is a great uh, component of the system, of the overall utility system, but it, it's not going to replace all our plants. So Texas um, is actually a great sun state, a uh, great resource for uh, solar. You get about uh, five to six hours a day of sun on average, depending on, on where you are, full sun. Um, Based on that, you know, you can see how that compares to the rest of the country. Um, Florida, being the sunshine state, actually gets less sun on average than Texas. Um, you get up in the green areas in the north, obviously uh, your amount of uh, solar resources is much, much lower. Uh, obviously, you get into the southwest here where you have a lot of sun. Seems like a great resource for solar, and it is. Uh, except the uh, downside here is that it's uh, quite hot. And a lot of people make the misconception that hot 
is great with solar. It's actually not. Solar panels are an electronic system and uh, the heat actually diminishes the, its efficiency. So really, uh, a cold climate with, with six or eight hours of sun would be much better than an extremely hot climate in terms of efficiency for the solar. Uh, but anyway, Texas is a great resource for solar. Uh, temperatures are, are okay in terms of that. It gets pretty hot here, but um, um, not unreasonably so for the solar. So how the solar really works. Obviously, you've got the photovoltaic panels up on the roof in a typical residential type system like this. Um, they connect down to an inverter, which connects the, the, the solar panels, of course, put out DC power connects to an inverter, which converts it from the DC to the AC. From there, it connects into your main electrical panel. Uh, and then from there, the power either is feeding the house and feeding the loads that are going on there, or if there are no loads going on at the house, uh, then it feeds back into the grid system. In order to do that, of course, it runs through the meter. Essentially, the meter runs backwards. Um, meter doesn't really care which way it's going. It, it just measures the power going in or out and gets the net total. Uh, so that's, you know, in concept, that's essentially all there is to it. There are no moving parts, so it's very dependable. And, uh, uh, and so the idea is when you have the solar, um, obviously it's making its sun or making its sun, making its power all day long when the sun is out. And that power, you know, typically most people are not home at, uh, during the day. So that power mostly back feeds to the grid. You come home, you're using power all night long. Now you're using power off the grid. So your meter is obviously going backwards all day long, switches over, and you're using power at night. You're paying for the net difference, if there is a difference. So that can work out very well to zero out your house. Basically what you're doing is you're sizing your system to produce enough power to match your actual usage over a period of time, typically a, a year. You'll take your year's power usage of the home. You'll divide that out to figure out how much power you need to produce per day. You'll size the system accordingly based on your climate. And that way, your system's back feeding at times, you're using it at times, but at the end of the year, you've net zeroed out. So talking a little bit about, whoops, net zeroing. Um, the meter can spin in either direction. Um, the key here is if you have a time of use meter. And what a time of use meter allows you to do, time of use energy usage, of course, is a lot like um, a lot like a cell phone, certain minutes of the day cost, well, it used to be this way, certain minutes of the day cost more than other minutes of the day, night minutes, for example. Well, obviously with power, uh, during peak time, that power is worth a lot more than during off-peak time. Nice thing about solar is it's producing power mostly in the afternoons, peak time, when you need it the most. So that power is worth the most. So therefore, you put in a time of use meter, now your power from your home or your business is sending power into the grid at peak rate. And so that's very valuable. Um, and then at night when you come home and you're using your power, you're using it at off peak rate. So much cheaper power. So therefore you can actually downsize your system because you're really not trying to equal kilowatt hours that you use versus what you produce. You're trying to negate the bill itself, the cost of the power. And so obviously, if you're putting super expensive power into the grid during the day, you don't need to put in as much as you're going to use at night, which is much cheaper. So, so most uh, utilities allow you the use of the time of use meter. Um, and typically, what they'll do is they'll uh, let you build up credits. In other words, you've used, uh, you've generated perhaps more power than you've used or uh, generated more, uh, wouldn't call it profits, but, but dollars in your account than what you're currently using. At the end of the year, they'll do a final settlement 
uh, where either uh, if you've used more power than you've produced, they send you a bill. If it's the other way around, they set it back to zero and say thank you very much. Uh, so there's really generally no advantage in putting in a system bigger than what you use. You don't want to be a net producer that has some other uh, negative effects. That's slowly starting to change and where that may be allowed and, and, and already is in some areas, but uh, currently that's the common way. Um, and this is critical in the financial feasibility of renewable energy, just because when you're, especially on the commercial scale, when you're uh, sizing systems, you're counting every rebate, every credit, every incentive, every kilowatt hour and, and rate that you can in order to make the uh, whole system pay off. So how solar actually works, uh, you may have noticed we have a solar panel here at the front, um, which you're welcome to come and uh, touch and look at and look at a little later on. We also have the inverter and we'll get to that. Uh, but solar itself, basically what it is, uh, it's silicon. Very, very, very pure silicon, about 99.9% .9 pure. And what happens is uh, the sunlight hits the silicon and natural reaction, the silicon basically vibrates, moves as a result of the sunlight. Uh, so very simply, behind the silicon layer is a network of, of wires, of conductors that uh, catches the um, electrons and that draws it in the, into a current. And that's really all there is to it. Each one of, uh, on the solar panel, each one of these squares might only be a watt and a half, but again, you get enough of them put together and, and you've got some substantial power. Uh, so that's really all there is to it. There are no moving parts, and that's really a key piece to the uh, longevity and dependability of solar is that there are no moving parts really nothing to break. Now it does break down slowly over time. Solar panels don't last forever. Um, typically you assume a degradation rate of about a half a percent per year, give or take, depending on the manufacturer of the panel. So you figure 20 years down the road you're gonna be producing 80, 85% of its original power capacity. So that's still, still pretty good. Uh, a couple of different types of solar panels out there you've probably heard or seen. Uh, crystalline, uh, amorphous thin film. They all work on the same principle. It's just different ways of putting the panels together in different processes. But they all work by the sunlight hitting the panel, moving the electrons, and the wires picking up that uh, current. So the primary components of any solar system, of course, uh, the photovoltaic modules, the support rack that holds those modules, and then the inverter itself. There are other pieces and parts and balance the system, but those are the key components of any system. Uh, the solar panels, of course, generate the DC current, and uh, there are a number of things that impact that. Shade, of course, has a huge impact on a solar panel. Um, you might only shade say a, a sixteenth of the solar panel, but because of the way it's wired, because of the way that the cells are, are wired, um, if you knock out you know, a, a quarter of a solar panel, you've cut production of it down by over 50%, typically. And that uh, has a huge impact on the efficiency of any system. So you might set up your array, maybe this tree only shades a little bit of it, or well, you have to realize that has a big impact, not only within the, each panel, but when you uh, set up an array, the panels are wired in series and then in series in parallel, typically both, and um, it has a huge, it just cuts down the efficiency a lot. So it's very important to have a shade-free environment with any solar system. Uh, another question that often comes up is uh, soiling of the solar panels. How often should you wash your solar panels? In parts of Texas, you get rain enough of the year to keep them fairly clean, and you probably never have to wash them. So other parts of Texas, you don't, and it can be quite dusty and quite dirty, and the panels would get uh, covered in a heavy layer of dust. How much does that really affect your production? Typically, 
a very soiled panel you know, to the point where it's, it's hard to even see the solar cells itself because of the layer of dust, will actually only cut production down about 10%. It's not a huge impact, surprisingly enough. So cleaning it often takes more energy than what you'd lose from the lost power of the soiling. So you really have to weigh how dirty does it get before, before you clean it. Now, if you're on a cattle ranch or something and, and you know, it might get really dusty and, and you'd want to clean it more often, uh, there are some systems out there for these types of environments where built-in sprinklers and things like that have been installed to clean them off occasionally. Those have been met with some success. Um, the cost of putting in that system, the cost of maintaining it, um, often outweighs the benefits. But anyway, uh, clouds, of course, also have a big impact on solar, and that's a, always a challenge for the utilities, especially with the larger utility scale solar systems. Um, you know, you've got uh, 5, 10 megawatts of solar going, and suddenly a cloud comes across, and boom, that's gone from the utility for a minute. And then cloud passes, and it's right back again. And that, that's a big dip to, uh, to absorb, and so that becomes difficult. On your house or whatnot, it makes no difference at all, of course, because the utility is basically acting as your backup or as your battery, if you will, for that type of system. For the support racks, um, there are three basic kinds that you'll see. And there, there are others, but three that are most common. The ground mount, uh, which is what you see here. Uh, there are solar canopies or, or carport type structures. And then the roof mount, which is probably the most common, especially when it comes to residential and a, and a lot of office buildings and warehouses of that sort. And we'll get more into that. Uh, and then the inverter itself, uh, which, as I mentioned, converts the power from DC to AC. Typically, the inverters will come with a 10-year warranty. Um, as you can see, that's about half of the warranty that the solar panels typically come from, come with. And the 10 year warranty, you know, there are some parts, it's electronics, there are some parts that uh, can wear out on the inverters. And so when you're doing the economic analysis on a solar system, you're always assuming that you're going to have an inverter replacement or refurbishment or something at about the half, half year, or not half year, half lifetime expectancy point of the system. Uh, so 10 year warranty usually assume about 15 years on the average inverter. They're getting better, we'll see. But for now, that's uh, the assumption. So PV modules themselves, um, uh, for purposes of today, I'm going to talk, uh, use Sharp as an example. There are a lot of manufacturers out there. Uh, Solar World, uh, based up in Oregon, is probably the biggest US-made owned company for solar out uh, in this country. Um, it's interesting, 20 years ago or so, almost all solar panels were made either in the U.S., 90% of them were made in the U.S., the rest were made in Japan. That's completely changed over the last 10 years, five years in particular. Um, U.S. almost makes no solar at all anymore. Uh, a lot of a lot of projects and, and government-funded solar projects require made in America solar panels. Really what that means is all the solar cells themselves are made in uh, China and the frames are made in China. They ship them over separately, they put them together, made in America. Um, so the reality is almost all solar panels now are made in China. And that's just been a change over the last five years, really, uh, where that, that has switched over. Um, but uh, Sharp is a Japanese company, of course, big company. They've been around a long time and uh, one of the most dependable modules on the market. Uh, in terms of efficiency, and this is hard to read, I apologize. Um, it, uh, I can't read that at all, but it's about 17% efficient. Uh, and uh, people often get hung up on, well, I want the most efficient module out there. That's the best if it's super efficient. Most efficient module on the market out there is actually 
Uh, Sun Power. Sun Power, again, made in China, but it's marketed in the US. Um, Sun Power modules are about uh, 20 to 21% efficient. Uh, most modules fall between 17 and 20%. So what does that mean? Okay, the Sun Power module, extremely efficient, very good module, nothing wrong with that module at all. Uh, you pay more per watt for the Sun Power module than you do for, say, the Sharp module. Quite a bit more. And so you, when you start laying out the size of a system, efficiency really only comes into play if you're limited on space. Otherwise, so you add one more panel and you've got the same amount of power output. Who cares if it's 17% you know, efficient or 20% efficient? You're making the same amount of power overall. Um, and often at a lower cost than if you went with the more efficient panel. So uh, never really want to get too hung up on efficiency itself. Um, again, most modules come with a 20 to 25 year warranty. And typically, um, typically you never have a problem with a module. Uh, modules that I've had to replace in the past have been primarily due to breakage, not failure of the module. Breakage due to golf balls going through them and things like that. Uh, typically, again, there are no moving parts. There's really nothing to break. They will slowly degrade. Occasionally, you'll see a frame delaminate from the glass or something, but even then, that typically does not hurt the energy production of the module itself. Um, JA Solar, one of the largest manufacturers of solar panels in the world. Uh, again, made in China. Um, it's only 17% efficient compared to the Sanyos and the Sun Powers. And, uh, but yet, the cost of it is so low that it's hard to, hard to compete with. So you're seeing it go in all over the place. You might not recognize it as JA Solar, uh, Chinese modules are often relabeled, different companies' names. So you'll see, um, you know, you see Solar World out there. Solar World has its own module. It's Chinese-made panel, been relabeled. Um, so everyone's heard about Solyndra, and here's an example of a Solyndra system uh, out in California, and. Um, There's a big thing, of course, about Solyndra and all the government funding that it got and then, and then going belly up, of course. Well, you know, what, why did Solyndra come into play and what, what happened there and, you know, how did that change? And it all backs up to the supply of silicon. A, number of, a couple of years ago, silicon, there were only a few manufacturers of pure silicon, mostly for the silicon industry, for the, the chips. And um, there was a shortage. There just wasn't enough silicon out there on the market. So module manufacturers started looking at ways of making solar modules that use a whole lot less silicon. And Solyndra came up with this idea of these uh, basically glass tubes with this flexible piece of silicon, think of it almost like a paper inside of it, where the sun hits it from any angle and, and produces power. It's a good idea. It's a good module, actually. Um, the problem is, about the time that Solyndra got really up and running, got their modules out, out there and really started taking off, a number of new plants came online developing or producing pure silicon. The silicon price dropped like a rock and suddenly there was plenty of silicon at a very cheap price and the Solyndra module was set up on you know, some, very, some relatively expensive other parts and pieces that went into it in order to minimize the amount of silicon. So basically the whole business model in terms of what, uh, what made sense in terms of the cost of the module itself flipped itself and Solyndra couldn't compete. Their modules just cost too much under that scenario. Uh, the lower cost of silicon barely <coughs> impacted them because they weren't using it much anyway. And so therefore their market uh, or their ability to compete in the market completely disappeared. So we lost Solyndra, which is actually too bad. It was a good, good product. Um, 
you know, silicon is one of the most abundant resources on the face of the earth, so I don't think we're going to run out of any anytime soon. But, um, but it does take a lot of energy to produce 99.9% .9 pure silicon. So how you actually make the cells themselves. Um, you cast ingots, if you will, uh, big tubes of pure silicon. Uh, and then you take those tubes and typically you'll cut off the edges uh, so that when you pack them into an array, you can pack them in more closely. And then you slice it like bread. So you just think of it taking, a, it's, it's, it's like a loaf of bread and you just slice it up and you lay it down on a panel. You put in your wiring uh, grid underneath it and you've got a solar panel. It's really not too complicated. It's interesting because this technology is the same, essentially, that NASA used way back when, when solar was really developed and uh, the technology really hasn't changed. And it's interesting because you'll see a number of people, well, I don't want to put in solar yet because in a few years down the road, the whole technology is going to change and we're going to have something completely different. My system will be old and out of date. Um, I would completely disagree with that. Over the last 25 years, solar panels are still essentially identical to what they were before. Now, the process of making them has changed a lot and the efficiency of making them, and uh, those sorts of manufacturing improvements have really, are really what have driven the cost down. Um, been some, definitely some improvements in efficiency modules 20, 25 years ago were typically 12 to 14 percent efficient. Um, but even, so you even think about that, 12 to 14 percent, now we're up to 17 to 20 percent. It's not a huge jump. And the reality is, if it, if it makes economic sense to put in a system on your home today, that economic sense doesn't go away tomorrow if some new technology does come out. It's still economically uh, logical to have that system. So, you know, I never uh, really hold much water with the idea that, well, you know, I'm going to wait for the next big breakthrough because it's probably not going to come. And you do see, you know, different technologies. You see thin film and, and these different processes, which we'll get into a little bit. But again, it's, it's for the most part, the exact same technology. We're not going to end up with solar panels next year that are, you know, 80% efficient all of a sudden, and you only need a table this big to power your house. It's just not going to happen. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, one thing you want to always keep in mind on any project is the module replacement challenges. If a module does go bad, um, and this becomes particularly true on systems where you have trackers or, or large-scale systems where, um, you know, the module has to fit into an existing array. Module sizes change constantly. So, for example, the module that we have on display here is a good-sized module. And... Um, say 10 years down the road, you've got a bunch of those on, on, on your array. One goes bad for whatever reason, it gets broken or whatever happens to it and you have to replace it. The odds of finding that same module, those same dimensions, those same power characteristics 10 years from now, almost zero. And more than that, the odds of the manufacturer who made that module probably won't be around anymore. Um, most, most module manufacturing companies, particularly particularly the ones coming out of China, a lot of turnover, a lot of consolidation, a lot going on. One thing about this market is it, it is always in flux. And so it becomes a real challenge uh, to find replacement modules in systems where a module breaks. And you can always tell when someone's had to replace a module because suddenly there's one module in their array that looks different from all the others. It's a different uh, physical dimension and because they had to match the power characteristics of the other modules. And uh, that's one reason why, depending on the client, depending on what you're trying to do, you often want to go with a module manufacturer who's been around for a long time, such as Sanyo, such as, um, you know, Solar World or, or whatever it might be, because at least you have a chance of finding that module again down the road. 
you use uh, some off-brand module, and if you ever have a problem, good luck. And that comes back to the warranty as well. Okay, so it comes with a 20-year warranty. What good does that really do you if that company stopped, you know, didn't exist after the you know, third year of your system? So it really does pay to use well-established brands rather than just the cheapest module out there. Uh, a lot of people will think that solar panels are really just a commodity and you just go with the lowest price and put them in. And that's great if all you're looking at is the upfront cost and the upfront you know, installation of the system, but it's not so great if you're maintaining that system over the next 20, 25 years. So there are a few, as I mentioned, a few different types of solar modules, the crystalline, the monocrystalline, multi-crystalline, amorphous, thin film, talked about cylinder already. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about the thin film in particular. Basically, it's a much thinner module, uh, can often be flexible, which has its advantages, can be wrapped into certain types of roofing systems where it's just laid in. Um, it uses less silicon to produce. Uh, and so it had, a, a few years ago, when there was the shortage of silicon, it, it had a big resurgence, if you will, in popularity. Uh, and was thought that, you know, in a few years' time here, we won't see anything except amorphous type panels, the thin film. A um, couple of downsides to this type of panel. Efficiency is quite a bit lower. Uh, typically, almost half of uh, your crystalline or multi-crystalline modules. Um, and so again, efficiency, as we said before, isn't a huge issue. Uh, the cost of them is also almost half, so when you balance it out that way, it makes sense. However, balance of system costs go up because you need twice as many of them to put in the same amount of power, so that means you need more racking, you need more, of course, cabling and, and conductors. Um, conduits, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. Um, does have some advantages, works better actually than crystalline in low light level environments. In other words, where you have a lot of fog, um, it, then the crystalline is pretty uh, efficient. I don't think we're going to see it take over the market. In fact, its uh, popularity is actually seeming to be on the decrease rather than on the increase compared to the crystalline. And talk about monocrystalline and multicrystalline. The module that we have up here uh, is a monocrystalline. In other words, it's as I showed before, you take the cylinder and you take a slice of it and you stick it on. Um, the multicrystalline, you take that same cylinder and you take shavings off of it and you stick those shavings together into squares. Think of it almost like a uh, you know, wafer board. Um, it's kind of that idea where you take the wood shavings and stick it together. It's basically the same thing with the solar. The multi-crystalline compared to the monocrystalline in terms of efficiency is very close. It's uh, typically a couple of percent, one or two percent less than the uh, monocrystalline. But the monocrystalline are definitely the most efficient module technology on the market. So, orientation to the sun. Um, There's the azimuth and the altitude, so the angle up and down and back and forth to the sun. Typically, you want to orient your solar arrays pretty much due south. If not due south, slightly to the west. It just depends on when you're trying to maximize your solar production. Um, many of you may be familiar with solar hot water, much the same thing. It has to be oriented directly due south, both azimuth and altitude, to really have any efficiency at all. Solar PV, a little bit different in that if it's not oriented perfectly to the sun, your production doesn't actually go down very much. So for example, if you lay your panels flat on the floor here, assuming this was outside, if you laid your panels flat versus aiming them perfectly at the sun, you're only gonna have maybe a 5% reduction in terms of your overall power. So when you think about it that way, okay, so I've got some flexibility. So if you're putting it on the roof of your house, and your roof angle isn't ideal for solar, 
do you put on a rack that makes it ideal, or do you just lay it flat on the roof? And I would say you lay it flat on the roof for aesthetic reasons, if nothing else, um, for wind loads, for a lot of different reasons. And your production as a result is not uh, hit enough to justify the additional cost and effort and ugliness, if you will, of having some strange rack system on, on the roof. That goes same with, uh, you know, if, if your roof or whatever you have isn't aimed perfectly due south, it's, uh, you know, 20 degrees to the west or even, you know, 15 degrees to the east. Um, you don't try to turn the panels to get perfectly aligned with the sun. You just put them on. You don't worry about the slight inefficiency because, because <clears throat> again, you can just add a, another panel or two or whatever you need to do in order to make that up and the system comes out looking clean. Um, sunlight versus ambient light, uh, as I'd mentioned with the thin film technologies, those are very efficient in ambient light conditions. Mostly what you have here is, is not that. You have good strong sunshine most of the time in most of Texas. So uh, you get down, uh, I don't know, along the coast, I don't know if you get much fog along the uh, I don't know, Corpus Christi area or something. I'm not quite sure that you do. But um, in those types of situations, then you might use a thin film cell. Um, shading, again, I can't emphasize enough. Shading is your number one killer with solar. That will hurt the efficiency in a, in a big way. And then temperature. Uh, so we talk about mounting the panels flat to the roof. Uh, flat to the roof, but you always want to have a gap behind the solar panels in that roof. Uh, otherwise, the temperatures, the temperature behind a panel, you, you put your hand on the back side of a panel in the sun, and it, it's hot. It'll burn your hand. And you don't want that heat. A, you don't want it transferring into your structure. But B, um, you don't want that heat reducing the efficiency of your module. So you always want to keep the modules up off the roof at least, at least a few inches. Uh, just to get some airflow going behind them and keep them as cool as you can to not have that loss in efficiency. So then the next big piece are the inverters. And as I mentioned, we have a uh, Sunny Boy SMA inverter here uh, that you can look at. The in my opinion, the SMA inverters are the Mercedes of the inverters on the market. They're almost bulletproof. They've been around a long time, uh, made in Germany, and an extremely dependable and very efficient inverter on the market. There are others out there. There's Fronius, there's uh, uh, Xantrex, and, and a number of others that have been around. All good products. Um, SMA has been a... a just bulletproof system. Um, you can hook everything up to it completely wrong, and it's got enough built-in protection where you won't destroy it. And that's key because uh, I've seen a lot of interesting hookups that would have <laughs> otherwise destroyed them. Uh, but anyway, the inverter basically converts, as I mentioned, the DC to AC. Um, inverters come in a multitude of sizes, of course. Uh, anywhere from, well, from very small, if you're just doing, you know, uh, powering your uh, computer or something like that. But for residential systems, typically they'll start at about 2kW and go up to about 10kW, it's typical sizing, um, and, and the whole range within that. Um, been a lot of talk on projects. Uh, central versus distributed on the inverters, particularly when it comes to commercial projects, even residential to a degree, and we'll get to that. Um, are you better off to have one big central inverter that feeds all the arrays, or are you better off to have a ton of small inverters distributed throughout the array? Pros and cons to both. And uh, I think each project and each situation, depending on what you're trying to achieve, makes that determination. There's no clean cut answers like, oh, you should always go with the central ember. Not true. A lot of conditions where you want to go with the distributed. Some of the pros and cons include, um, with the distributed, of course, 
if you do have a problem with an inverter, your whole system isn't down, just that portion of it. And so that's a big plus in terms of overall system dependability. Your system stays up and running. You've only lost a certain portion of it. And you find out about that very quickly through the management system and go repair that inverter. That's a big plus. Um, advantages to a, or a, a centralized inverter um, is that uh, it does have some efficiency it, uh, abilities in terms of everything comes to one central location and it makes the wiring pretty straightforward and, uh, uh, you know, it, it can be, you know, depending on your layout, much more, much easier to accommodate a single inverter location. And so that can work. And if something goes wrong with it, yes, it's, it can go down. But again, inverters are, are very dependable and are generally aren't down very often. So just depending on what you're trying to do. Um, the Sunny Boy, again, is uh, set up to work where, with multiple Sunny Boys. So you can line them up uh, all, you know, all the way down one edge of the roof or a wall or wherever you want to put them and run two arrays all over. And, uh, works very well for that. You have transformer lists and transformer inverters. Transformer lists are pretty new on the market, and I don't know if you're seeing too many of those here or not at this point. Um, they're much lighter, much cheaper as a result. Uh, they don't have all that copper in them for the transformer. Um, and they're higher efficiency. So that's all big pluses for the transformers. Not every, every not every place allows them yet. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the differences and the pros and cons between those. Uh, and then the inverter expected lifespan, as I'd mentioned, typically talking about 15 years on an inverter. Uh, it's the only piece of the system typically that has move, well, moving parts, electrical parts to it that, that can fail over time. Most inverters, the failures are caused by the fans the cooling fan breaks, the inverter overheats, shoots it. So again, it's, the, it's interesting. The electronics and everything are pretty bulletproof, very dependable. It's a simple thing like a cooling fan that can destroy the whole thing. Early on, SMA had problems with their fans. And uh, the company was actually excellent that even if inverters were out of warranty, they replaced them for free. They knew that it was an issue. Yes, sir? Good question. Glad you brought that up. Um, micro inverters, you've probably seen very small inverters, goes on the back of each module and gets rid of the whole centralized uh, inverter. It really is truly an example of the distributed system, even at the residential level. And the micro inverter hasn't been around that long, so we don't really know. But from what I've seen, the dependability on it's been very good. Um, haven't come across too many issues where those have failed. Um, the main issue with the micro inverters that I see is that that market is still very young. The people manufacturing them are constantly changing exactly how it's working. So I think the big problem with the micro inverters at this point is going to be a few years down the road when you have to replace one or replace a module. Again, you have that same compatibility issue. That'll go away over time as, as the market consolidates and, and matures a little bit. Um, but I think the microinverter is a great way to go, actually. It makes a lot of sense and makes it really easy. Uh, what we've seen a lot of with the microinverter in particular is what we call guerrilla solar systems. In other words, people live in rentals or apartments or whatever. They'll buy solar panels with a microinverter on it, hack the wires off and put a plug on it, and plug it into an outlet in their house, and now they've got solar. Extremely dangerous. Of course, and from a code perspective, it's the worst thing you could possibly do, but it's so easy that uh, people are realizing, hey, I don't need a solar installer. I can just go buy a couple of these panels and plug them right into my outlet, and I'm good to go. So watch for that when you're out there, because we're seeing more and more of it. Um, so inverters are kind of an interesting thing in that the Chinese market has not started to dominate here at all. Um, USA and Germany are the primary manufacturers of inverters. And so uh, hopefully that'll stay the same. 
for projects that require made in America products, well, this is an easy one. Inverters are, are made here, including the SMA. They have plants here in the United States too, so that is a made in America product. So for residential, um, again, the Sunny Boy, the Fronius, um, Xantrex. Uh, Xantrex is probably one of the oldest inverter manufacturers um, on the market um, and has gone through a number of name changes. It's been bought out num numerous times over its years, but it's still, still out there. Uh, typical residential inverters are typically about 97, 98% efficient, right in that range. So 20 years ago, inverters weren't nearly as efficient as they are now. That efficiency has grown dramatically. And 20 years ago, a lot of off-grid or, or solar-powered homes, they would wire as much as they could DC, um, much like an RV or something. You'd have DC appliances and you'd set it up that way because you didn't want to have those 20% losses that you're going to have through your inverter. You had to put in a much bigger solar system in order to, to power your loads. And so it's very common to have you know, a lot of DC stuff, DC lighting and stuff like that, and then you just ran AC for the things that you had to have AC for because you just couldn't do it another way. Um, that's almost all completely gone away at this point with 97, 98% efficient inverters. It's just not worth the hassle and trouble of running a, a DC distribution system along with an AC distribution system. You just put it all in and uh, your typical AC and, and not worry about it. Um, so again, 15 to 20 year life expectancy on most inverters. And you know, you figure your overall solar system has about a maximum of about a 30 year life. Your solar modules, you know, a 20, 25 year warranty, but they'll keep going. Uh, efficiency will drop off over time, but you can get an easy 30 years out of a solar system. Uh, and uh, you just assume that halfway through you're replacing your invert. And that's just part of the cost of having it and you, you figure that into your economics. Um, now when the if you're a homeowner and Solar City comes to your, well, not Solar City, because they're under a different type of situation, but most solar providers, when they come and they are offering you a, a system, they won't mention that 15 years down the road you're going to need a new inverter. They're always looking at it saying, Here, here's your install price, here's your payback over time, and year X, you know, it's paid for itself and you're good to go for the next 20 years or so. But you always got to look at the inverter because it will need to be replaced more than likely at some point in time. Now, if you place those inverters in a protected location on the shady side of the house, under an eave, in the garage, whatever, it will last a lot longer than if it's just right out there in the blazing sun. That will make a big difference on the lifespan of the inverters. Because again, if it's in a cooler location, the fan failure won't necessarily kill the inverter. So in terms of commercial scale inverters, again, you can use you know, the d more distributed sized uh, SMA makes uh, you know, small inverters. They also make uh, 500 kW inverters and uh, can even combine them to make you know, one megawatt inverters. Advanced Energy is another uh, well-known brand for uh, commercial scale inverters. Um, 500 kW is, is pretty common. They'll typically start at about 100 kW and go up in various increments, 250 kW, 300, 500. Uh, we're starting to see more and more one megawatt inverters for the larger uh, plants, and particularly when you start to get the utility scale projects um, where you'll group them and, and have at least one, K, one megawatt inverters. Um, Again, you're still looking at about a 15 year life, even on the large scale commercial inverters. So you just assume that halfway through, you're gonna replace the inverter or at least do a major overhaul if nothing else. This is a system. There it goes. Of a series of inverters uh, for a large, uh, this was, was it uh, two megawatt um, tracking, single axis tracking array uh, for an airport in California. Um, 
So this gives an example of your more distributed inverter array versus your centralized inverter array. Um, in this particular case, all the distributed inverters were grouped together. They don't have to be. They can be truly distributed throughout the site as well. Um, part of the challenge with the distributed process, and, and if you were to put these inverters out amongst the array itself, is that the inverters have to be mounted vertically. You can't mount them at an angle. You can't do funny things. And so if you're out on a big roof, big commercial roof, um, in order to do that, you have to have towers, if you will, that these inverters are mounted on. Those create shade and everything, so then you, now you need pretty good area around them so you're not shading other arrays and everything. So it's often easier just to group them all together in one location and run all your conductors back in order to uh, support them. Um, a lot of early examples uh, actually had the arrays or had the inverters distributed out on the arrays, kind of laying down flat on the roofs and didn't take too long before they were failing. And code-wise, that just uh, didn't cut it. They're, they're designed for a vertical mount application. Some of them can be mounted at certain degrees of angles, but, but typically not flat. So the transformerless inverters. Um, Conventional inverters, they have a transformer, obviously, that synchronizes the DC with the AC output. Whereas the transformerless uses a computerized process with electronic components to achieve that same thing. But there are some differences as a result. Some of the benefits, as I mentioned, it's lighter weight um, and have slightly higher efficiency. So that's all good. Um, however, in the installation, oops, there are some differences in terms of how the circuits are wired and switched and everything else. And so if you're out there and you're looking at systems, you have to understand if it is a transformerless inverter, uh, some of the wiring changes as a result. Um, you still have to have your PV equipment grounds, but not the source itself is not grounded. So it's often a misunderstanding, particularly amongst installers, if they're not familiar with the transformerless inverter, they're thinking, oh, there's no grounding required. Well, it's absolutely not true in terms of your equipment ground. It's all got to be there. Um, just the negative conductor of the PV array that's not grounded. Uh, yes, I think that's correct. Yeah. Just a just a quick reminder. Sorry, if you have a question, if you would use the mics to make sure we pick up the audio, just hit the button on the base of the whatever you call this platform. Sure. Oh, if you'll hit the button again. Sorry. Wait. Is that better? Okay. Uh, Tony, I've I've heard that smart inverters are forthcoming on the market in the next few years. Are you able to tell us anything about those? Um, not really, actually. I haven't seen them yet. And um, in terms of their overall capabilities and how they'll meet the current power fluctuations, demands, and everything, I haven't really seen uh, too much on it yet. So I, I don't have any detailed information. So I am moving on from inverters onto racks. So if there are other questions related to the inverters, we can do that. OK. Uh, so we've got roof mount, ground mount, parking canopies. Those are your typical types of racks that are out there. Um, I'm sure you know, you've all seen the carports, um, various types of roof mounts, depending on if it's on a residence or on a commercial building. Uh, and then ground mount systems. A number of different ways to do all this. Um, we'll start off with uh, commercial systems. Typically on a commercial roof you have two types, the ballasted or the penetrating roof racks. Uh, 
ballasted are just that. They're non-penetrating, typically, on the roof, so no holes in the roof. Uh, there's typically pavers to weigh them down, hold them. Um, a lot of engineering goes into these systems. A uh, number of installers will try to just use the products manufacturing information uh, concerning how many pavers you need and everything else when they come in for permitting. Uh, but depending on the roof, the parapets, how close it is to the edge of the roofs, corner locations in particular of roofs, wind loads vary a lot. And so really uh, each system needs to be specifically engineered for each roof because uh, the number of pavers on these systems is not the same throughout the system. The middle of the array will not need nearly as many pavers as the perimeter edge or in particular the corners. Uh, so you really want to make sure that when uh, these systems come in for permit review that uh, the engineering has been done for that specific system on that particular roof. Um, now here you don't have the same seismic concerns so you're not worried about the array suddenly shifting a few feet one way or the other in, a, in an earthquake type thing but nonetheless with the winds that you can get here particularly in parts of the state uh, you got to make sure that those wind loads, particularly again at the corners, have been accounted for. Um, in hurricane or, or tornado areas, uh, these systems, the ballasted systems, aren't always appropriate. Sometimes you just can't get them to calc out. There have been uh, other approaches to using the ballasted system in those environments. Um, we've done another number of systems uh, actually, in, in, in Vietnam, where uh, the, the winds can be quite strong during uh, certain times of the season. And what they'll do is use this same type of array or ballasted system and run cables through the system itself that then tie to the parapets or tie down over the roof so that the whole system in a high wind event might do this, but it can't do that. Um, and the whole system is, uh, is integrally, integ integrally tied together, so it can't come apart, per se, but it can do a little bit of this on the roof. Um, weight, you know, that's always a consideration. You've got all these pavers on your roof. What's, what's the weight and what's that doing to your roof? Uh, typically, even with a ballasted system, you're still only around five pounds a square foot, maybe seven. And so most roof loads can handle a five or seven pound load, uh, particularly when you take into consideration that, you know, for your live load, there's a live load on the roof. Um, wherever you've put panels, you can no longer walk. There's no longer need for a live load there. So you can, most building departments will allow you to use a, that live load for your solar panel array because, uh, again, it's typically at seven pounds is typically lower than your live load requirements. Um, nice thing is, again, the new no roof penetrations. So you're not putting a bunch of holes in your roof. So number one, you're not putting, you know, uh, potential leaks into your building. Um, and you can typically maintain your roof warranty. And roof warranty is always a big issue when you're putting solar onto a commercial building. Um, once in a while, it works out great where it's a brand new roof and you're putting on the solar right away. More times than not, it's an older roof and you're putting on solar and maintaining an existing warranty can be difficult at best. Um, so if you're not putting in penetrations, uh, it takes you a long ways. One of the tricks with the ballasted system, however, is if you have a lot of roof equipment or conduits and pipes running across your roof, it doesn't work well with that. It's not up off the roof. It, it's right down on it. And uh, you can't put it over you know, fans or vents or things like that. You have to work around those things. Um, so you have to look at your particular roof and structure to determine you know, what type of system makes the most sense. It's not a one size fits all. You can't just assume you're going to you know, use this system on every roof you do. Um, so then you get to the penetrated type systems, which are more of your typical arrays on the roof itself in this fashion. Um, and in this case, it has legs that then do penetrate that roof. 
and tied directly into the structure underneath. These can be a little bit trickier because now you're putting point loads down onto that structure versus up here, it's really, it's a distributed, evenly distributed type load. Um, but again, depending on the type of roof and what you're trying to achieve, sometimes this makes more sense. But you have to, again, there, there's a bit of engineering involved to make sure that your existing structural system on that roof can support these point loads and the wind that uh, comes with that. Um, with the multiple penetrations that you have, now you have an issue in terms of you know, potential leaks and, and you almost always have to get your original roofer out there to do all these penetrations in order to have any hope at all of maintaining that roof warranty. Um, often it's a question, okay, I've got a roof on my building, it's already 12 years old, I want to put on solar, do I replace the roof now and do the solar together even though I've got another, I don't know, five, ten years left on that roof. Um, you know, what makes sense in terms of how, how you do that? It's often difficult, to, you know, if, depending on the financial structure that you're using to put the solar on, it's difficult to justify the additional cost of a new roof with that solar. And so how do you do that? Or you don't want to have that capital expense right now because, you know, you, you have that slated out for another five or six years. Sometimes uh, the PV provider will set up a, a deal where they'll wrap the cost of that new roof into their system, you know, distribute it out where it becomes part of the power cost on, on the energy that you're purchasing. But that has a huge impact on the economics. So it's always a question of do you roof now or, or do you do it later? Do you take the system off at some point and re-roof and put the system back on and the costs associated with that? I highly recommend not doing that because that is expensive and trying to find a, that same PV provider, whoever it might be, to come out and do that, it, it typically doesn't make sense. So that's one of the first things you're always looking at when you're doing a site survey is what's the age of the roof and the condition of that roof and, and the drainage and, and uh, roof penetrations and everything else. So this, this kills me. Um, that somebody would actually do that. Uh, it comes back to size the system appropriately for the space that you have available. Don't try to get every panel you possibly can because you end up, you know, how would you like to live next door to that? <laughs> and I have to look at that all the time. Um, and, you know, the wind loads and just trying to support that thing is, is crazy. Uh, so it, it, it amazes me what uh, some systems people will do. Uh, but what this gets to is the types of roofs. Uh, a composition roof is by far the easiest roof in the world to mount a solar PV system onto. And the racking systems for that is very simple. Uh, Unirack, there are a lot of manufacturers of systems out there where it's typically an aluminum rail, extruded rail, uh, that mounts directly down to the roof. Um, with a composition roof, you can literally bolt right to the rafters underneath and put a sleeve over it, um, you know, a collar and sleeve, and, and it's not going anywhere. Um, and it, it's not going to leave. Composition's great. It's almost self-healing in a large way. So that's easy. Where it gets tricky is with tile roofs. Um, tile, you need special jacks or special mounts that slide in under the tile and connect directly to the structure. You know, you can't just go to the substrate. It's got to go to the rafters. Um, this is one area, it's hard to inspect, but I've seen it so often where they miss. The jack does not connect to a rafter. And uh, it's hard to tell. I find, though, that if you go along the array and, and you give a good tug up on it, if there's any up and down movement, it means they're into the plywood or space sheeting or, or whatever else and not into a rafter itself. And it can make the whole difference in a high wind situation as to whether or not that thing's going to stay on the roof or not. Um, but if it's on a rafter, uh, it works pretty well. Tile is still a trick. Um, you're seeing a lot of people do it. But um, 
Personally, I try to avoid tile roofs anytime I possibly can because it is difficult to get in there and get the jacks in and not break any tiles, or if you do, trying to find replacement tiles for that area. Um, it's difficult to get them in there in such a way so that uh, you haven't created a potential leak into the house, which has a whole bunch of liability uh, associated with it. So the tile's just tricky. Often you'll see um, on a tile roof, they'll just clear the tiles from that whole area and put in a composition or, or roll type roofing in that area, put in the solar panels and bring up the tiles around the array itself. It's another way to get around that issue. But uh, tile's just not that fun. It's a great roof, but it's not that great for solar. Uh, standing seam metal roofs are actually great for solar. Uh, you can use clips. Uh, S5 is probably the most common. Um, that literally just clip onto the standing seam and either can clip onto a rail or directly to the module itself. And uh, we've used this quite a bit. The only key that you really have to watch here is to make sure that that metal roof is properly attached to the structure below. Um, because if, obviously if it's not, uh, your system's only as strong as those connections. So, um, in other words, in a high wind event, the module will take the roof with it if that roof isn't properly attached to the structure. Then you've got various types of ground mount racks. Um, we'll start with the pole mount, uh, which can be tracking or fixed, and you may have seen a number of these. Um, if it's fixed, uh, which is what uh, is in the picture here, you know, you set the orientation and you can set it do south, whatever you want it to be, and lock it in, and you're good to go. It's a fairly inexpensive way to have a system if you don't have a roof or, or a building to put it on. Um, you do have a footing as to be designed, you know, obviously for the height and the area of the array itself. Um, but it, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, the poles and the racks that are pre-designed, pre-engineered, uh, very robust, and uh, it's a solid system. The other option is with this is if it tracks. And it can either be a single axis or a dual axis tracker. Typically, if it's on a pole, it'll be dual axis. So it'll literally track the sun from sunrise all the way to sunset. Uh, that's a huge boost for efficiency on your system. That'll boost it up uh, about 50% for throughout the period of a day. Um, so that has a great benefit. So you have to weigh that additional power with the cost of that tracking system. And typically it will pay for itself very quickly. Uh, however, it's a moving part. And all that means is there's maintenance involved and it will break some point in time. And then again, you gotta find the parts and pieces 10 years down the road if that manufacturer's around and, uh, and, and fix it. Um, You'll see a lot of tracking on off-grid systems. And that's because typically an off-grid system is charging batteries. And batteries like to be charged as evenly as they can for a long period of time. So if you're getting solid sun from sunrise all the way to sunset, that's an excellent way to charge a battery system. Versus if it's fixed, you're only really hitting that battery hard for a fairly relatively short period of day. Uh, so. Uh, the other time you'll see a lot of trackers used is on much larger uh, commercial installations or, or utility scale installations where there's a full-time or, or local maintenance team to maintain that whole system. Um, most of the time though for commercial systems, you're gonna have more of your large scale either fixed or tracking systems. And these are typically single axis. So rather than following the sun from sunrise to sunset, it, it does that, but only in, in a single axis. Um, and an interesting thing, when you have a single axis tracking system, it's not mounted south. So assuming, I, I don't know where my orientation is right now, but is, is that south over there? Well, I have my back to you. So we're gonna pretend south is this way. Um, typically your array is set like this, so it's facing south. Well, if it's a single axis array, 
you actually face it so it's north south in this direction so it's picking up the morning sun that's flat at afternoon and then picks up the late afternoon sun um, so it's a 90 degree orientation difference from what you would normally see if it's like this where it's a fixed array facing south and doesn't move so the single axis tracking systems for a fixed array you can have those arrays can be quite large they can be um, four or five modules wide and, and however long you want to go. For a tracking system though, typically it's one, uh, maybe two modules wide per array. And that's because uh, in order to track these, what it is, it's on a, on a long rod typically, and then there's, you can just kind of make it out there. Um, a long bar that goes between all the arrays with the motor at the end. And it just pulls them all back and forth one way or another as, as the sun moves. Um, and so it's hard to have too big of an array. The structure on that becomes cumbersome. So again, typically there'll just be a couple of one or two rows of uh, modules per array. Again, the catch with any tracking system is the moving parts. It will break. And that will be the weakest link in your whole system. If it breaks, what do you do? Well, hopefully you can adjust it to at least be in a flat position so you can still maximize your sun. You're gonna lose you know, 30% perhaps of your solar production overall, but you, you don't want it to be broken in the, the sunrise position, for example, or you're gonna really have a hit. Um, you know, typically, it, for example, on this array here, you've got a bar going all the way and you've got one motor located, you know, down at the end. And so, again, this is typically used in utility scale or large commercial arrays, and you have a local presence there of maintenance folks who are there. They've got spare motors, because they know this is gonna break, uh, ready to go, so it can be switched out fairly quickly. This is not something you do in, in your backyard or, or something like that, a smaller system where you just don't have that level of maintenance. Footings, um, you'll see particularly on these larger arrays, the footing systems that are being developed. Um, in the past, it's, you know, you drill a hole, you put in your pipe, you fill the concrete. Uh, that's starting to change to where you just drive in augers and that is your footing. Um, uh, it's all GPS and computerized and you just run this piece of equipment right down the line, just drills them in exactly in line and, and sets your array uh, footings and, you know, depending on your soils and everything else, determines how big, how often, how deep, all that good stuff. But, you know, as part of an array, you have to do full soils tests and everything else to know your footing design. The other thing that you start to see here is the vegetation aspect. Um, vegetation, particularly if it gets too tall, can shade your array, especially at the lower edges here. And so vegetation control is key. You'll see some arrays where they'll come in and just gravel the whole area and say there and spray it once a year or whatever and kill it. Other ones like this where they'll go in and, and cut it, uh, which is, a, again, a lot of maintenance. Um, so vegetation control is a concern. Um, also, you don't, you don't want dead vegetation all underneath it. It becomes a fire hazard. So then you've got your parking canopies. And a uh, couple of typical types. Uh, you've got a single or double cantilever. Think of it as a T and you park under either side. There are systems out there that have columns all over the place that tend to get hit by cars. Ideally, you try to keep them down the center so that uh, uh, it, it, you don't have or columns in the, you know, where you're backing in and out. Um, typically with the carport canopies, the aisles, the drive aisles, the parking lot are left open and, and you park underneath the canopy itself. Um, You'll also see some larger array type canopies where the parking and aisles and everything are, are covered. One of the catches with all of these is, is what height do you put them? How high does it need to be? If it's over driving aisles, well then you have to maintain certain height requirements for the fire department and everything, typically at least 14 feet clear to underside a structure so that uh, emergency vehicles and, and can get through it. 
If it doesn't cover the drive aisles, then you can be down typically as low as nine feet um, coverage. Um, how high you go, of course, has a big impact on your footings and cost associated with that. So typically, most PV providers will try to put them as low as they can uh, based on the requirements of that site, just to save money. Um, this is out of the types of systems we're looking at, the ground mount, the roof mount, and this system, uh, the most expensive, just again, because the, of the structure. It's a lot of structure for the amount of PV that you're really getting out of it. But typically, parking lots are a great place for PV because it's open land that you can't do anything else with anyway other than park. People like having the shaded parking. Um, and so it's a great, great use of uh, space. Um, question often comes up, you know, in terms of rain. And these systems typically are not rain protection structures. In other words, the it, it drips all over the place. The rain comes in between the panels and everything else. Uh, so if, if moisture protection is a concern also, you'll often see these systems where they've built the same structure, put on a metal deck, and then mounted the modules on top of them uh, to get that additional rain protection. Most times, you won't see that because who cares? The car was getting wet out there before. It's still getting wet out there. So, but the difference is with the modules, now that rain's coming through in drops, you know, in specific locations rather than evenly spread. So it just so happens that nine times out of 10, you'll be unlocking your car and it goes right down in the back of your neck because it just works out that way. I don't know why. Uh, so then you've, so those are your basic parts to your PV system. And you've got your balance of system. You've got your combiner boxes, and you've got you know, your, just a basic combiner box, um, which just brings your various strings together from the arrays and combines them to go back to the inverter. That's basically what a combiner box does. Um, you can only have so many modules in a string, and that's largely because the inverter is set up to only handle you know, uh, voltage and, and power up to certain levels. Typically, uh, well, modules are often around 50 volts, 48 volts, somewhere in that range. You can't go over 600 volts in most systems, so you can only line up so many panels. That makes a string, comes back to your inverter. So you have multiple strings coming back to your inverter, and those strings are combined in the combiner box. Um, again, you have basic versus smart. Basic is where just those strings come in to a terminus block, essentially, and goes back to the inverter. Smart is when you have, <coughs> excuse me, electronic controls on those uh, strings so that the inverter and your overall data management system for, this, for your array knows exactly what your power production is for any of those strings. Nice thing about that, if there's ever a problem with a panel or anything goes wrong in a string, you've immediately narrowed down exactly where the problem is, you know where to start. Whereas if you have a big centralized inverter with, with, without brains behind your combiner boxes, you have no idea if your power production drops off a little bit, you don't know where to start looking at all. You have to go out there with your voltmeter and start checking every single um, every single string throughout your system to try to identify where the weak one is. And then out of that string of modules, you can start going through and narrowing it down. So it's a big advantage if you can do that. Yes, sir? Typically, uh, you know, a system is designed to be a 600 volt system. Uh, when you start going utility scale, uh, there are things you can do where you can go up 1,000 volts. Uh, but you're not going to see that on any residential scale or typical commercial project. Um, every system has to have a utility disconnect. And uh, when we get into the code corner portion, we'll hear a little bit more about the disconnect and, and requirements there. Um, but uh, the system, typically that disconnected, particularly on a residence, is supposed to be within 10 feet of the utility connection point, the meter, um, so that if there's ever a problem, the utility can come in and shut off your system to 
mostly as a say it's an extra level of safety. The inverters already are designed so that if they're not receiving a signal from the utility, they're supposed to go off within, uh, I can't remember, a couple of milliseconds or so of the grid going down. The reason, of course, is you don't ever want to backfeed the grid. The line guys are out there trying to fix something. You don't want to be energizing the grid. Um, so you have to have the utility disconnect. And, uh, whoops. Um, and then you've got a system monitoring the software and the weather station. So for a typical residential systems, such as, again, the SMA that we have here, uh, it comes with built-in uh, software in, in the uh, inverter itself, as well as you go online, you download the free software onto your laptop. And you can monitor your system with an amazing amount of detail and information. And uh, that information is key in knowing exactly what your system's producing, if it's working, what you can track it every day over the months, over the year, and you can compare year to year, and it graphs it for you and does all kinds of great stuff. Um, and most inverters will do that. Um, and that's key to knowing if your system's functioning the way it's supposed to and, and required. Uh, for larger scale systems, you will also include a weather station, something that indicates the wind speeds, the temperatures, um, the isolation values, the sunlight, uh, or the insulation values. And uh, that way, you know, all those factors play into the efficiency of a system at any time. And so this gives you a much better understanding of how your system's performing based on the actual environmental conditions at any given time. This all works into the software that then analyzes and again graphs it all out to determine if your system's working the way it's supposed to. There's a lot of third party software companies out there providing this, providing this software for PV systems. Um, there's been a little bit of a, I'd call it almost a, a little bit of a battle going on between the inverter manufacturers and some of these software systems. The inverters, of course, they want to provide this software because there, there's, it, it's an added benefit to the customer. Um, a lot of these third-party software firms that are providing this, they, the way they make their money is they have an annual fee in order to provide this information to you. And so depending on the structure and who owns the system and you know whether or not it's owned by the actual landowner or a third party or if it's a power purchase agreement, all these different structures for uh, PV systems has a lot to do with all right, does it make sense to use this third party monitoring? Who's going to pay those fees? And, and tying all that together becomes a little bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, so what we're seeing more and more, though, is this third party stuff is starting to, to, to diminish. And the inverters themselves, the inverter manufacturers, are expanding their capabilities in terms of the monitoring to uh, provide a lot of that service. So the Sunny Boy, for example, is set up to connect with uh, weather stations and everything else to bring all this together for most customers. Large, large utility scale companies will still typically use a third party because it can engage quite a bit more information than most of the inverter systems will allow. So then the uh, PV warranties. Um, there are a couple of different types of warranties related to a PV system. There are the product warranties, uh, which come with the modules, of course. The, the modules, as we mentioned, are typically 20, 25 years. Um, and the inverter, which is another typically 10 years, it depends. Uh, most inverters come with a five-year warranty. A lot of jurisdictions require a 10-year warranty, so they just adjust the price a little bit, and then you've got a 10-year warranty on the inverter. Um, and then you've got the warranty from the installer itself. And that often becomes more important than the manufacturer's warranties. Uh, the pro product warranties only cover the product, of course. If it wasn't installed right or if the wiring fails or there's a bad connection or, you know, whatever might happen, um, that's when you need that warranty from the installer. Uh, 
requirements on installation warranties vary all over the country. And for example, the state of California, the state requires a 10 year warranty on that installation. Other states have done the same thing. Some states only require five. There are a couple of states that only require one year warranty. Um, I think that's actually one of the best things that I've seen are these 10 year warranty requirements on that installation. It makes the installer really think about when they're installing this to do it right and do it well because they don't want to come back. There's no profit if they have to come back. Um, so I think that's been a good thing. And of course, it protects the homeowner or business owner, or whatever the case might be as well. And that warranty has to be for labor, materials, whatever it takes. There's, there's no cost to the uh, owner for that. So the thing that makes solar work are the rebates and incentives. Um, it's still not grid parity level in most areas to just uh, make sense economically on its own. So there's still the 30% federal protection, federal production tax credit, um, which is a great rebate that's basically 30% of the cost of the system overall that you get to take a, a tax credit on. Um, that is a great deal that cuts the cost of your system down by 30% if you have the tax uh, appetite in the first place. Most people do. Um, so for a residential system, it's typically never an issue. Some businesses and companies, the way they're set up and their tax situations, or if it's a nonprofit, such as a government agency, there's no advantage with that credit. So that becomes a challenge for the uh, uh, public agencies. And we'll talk about that uh, in detail tomorrow, actually. Um, this website, Desire, uh, is a great resource. If you go to that site and you pick Texas, it'll list every single rebate available for every utility, every city, every county, and the state as a whole uh, related to energy conservation. Um, so not just solar, but even just energy uh, efficiency and, and conservation. But it is a great resource for finding out everything that's available in any given area um, anywhere in the country. So I highly recommend you look at that and we'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow as well. Um, so in terms of incentives, so you've got uh, rebates and incentives are your two primary sources of making solar pay for itself. Um, so with the incentives, you have accelerated depreciation for a commercial system. That doesn't help the residential. Uh, that's a five year depreciation on the system. So that's a huge benefit. If you're putting in a million dollar system, you get to depreciate that whole thing in five years. Um, that, that adds up quickly as a big incentive. Uh, state of Texas incentives. Um, there are some out there. Again, the desire site starts to identify what's available. And depending on what kind of business, depending on where you're located, depending on you know, so many different factors determines whether or not uh, you can uh, take advantage of some of these incentives. And then the utility incentives. Um, Encore, of course, in this area, uh, does provide uh, solar incentives, rebates. Um, a 5.3 kW system results in about an $8,600 incentive, uh, which is a big help when it comes to the overall cost. Tony, excuse me. Yes. Tony. Oh right here in front of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, Our, I think that's actually last year's totals. Our incentives are lower this year. Have they come down? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's about a dollar per uh, DC watt. Dollar a watt? Okay. Yeah, yeah so, it's come down So it's a, a little bit, but but yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think Desire runs a little bit behind sometimes, so. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I think they do sometimes. Um, okay. 